I'm happy to be in Berlin here. I'm Christine Redeker from the European Commission Joint Research Center, and I would like to welcome you and our panelists for this hopefully controversial and inspiring debate. So this is our first panel discussion. We'll have another one later in the afternoon. And today, this morning, we're looking at looking ahead the impact of digital transformation on student mobility, teaching, and learning. This will be our topics. Now, you know, this morning, we did a little bit, uh, uh, a little small survey to which 59 of you contributed. Thank you very much for that. Can we have the results of that? So, ah, I can even see it. So, we can, we can see the lines, the colors, but we cannot see the labels underneath. So I'll try to read them out for you. So let's have a guess. Just, no, but I also see there. So I was, um, what do you think would be the most important term? Just some, some people, tell me, what do you think was the winner? What do you think? The first one, what, what is it? You cannot read it, but guess, have a guess. MOOCs? Who thinks it's MOOCs? No. European uh, University Networks? No. Um, diversity? No. What, what is it? What is it? Virtual mobility. So the absolute top is virtual mobility followed by collaboration and OER. And this is great for me because it brings me ta directly to our first panelist, to uh, Mr. Christian Müller from, um, from the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service. So if we now see that virtual mobility is so high, and can you guess where student mobility is? What would you guess? What would you give it? We also have student mobility there on the graph. What is it? A 22? A 7? A 14? It's a 4. So, how can you explain that, and how do you see the future of student mobility and virtual mobility? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Christian Müller, Deputy Secretary General at DAD, and in my former position since uh, before July, I was also uh, attached to this conference and to the preparation of this conference. I'm very happy that my successor, Christiane Schmeken, and her uh, collaborator, um, uh, Alexander Gerstner, that she, they, they both took up this project and brought to this, this um, event which we are seeing today. Well, I would say that if you ask somebody like me, like me a senior staff member at DRD, what do I think between the, well, the, the two points of virtual versus physical mobility, obviously I have to say physical mobility will remain and still is strong. In fact, it is strong. And if we look on the latest figures uh, at the, the publication of OECD, which is called uh, um, Education at a Glance, we see that, again, the figures rose in the yearly basis by 6.4%. So we are now at 5 million international mobile students, which is a huge uh, community. So it is a large number, and it still continues to grow. We ourselves, DAD, support something like 120,000 people per year to cross borders, to do a mobility uh, um, a sojourn abroad, <clears throat> to come to Germany to go abroad. So it is, it still is, and in my opinion will remain, <clears throat> will remain an important feature of higher education. Now, what I think is that digitization is bound to, to change how international mobility will happen in the future, it will not replace it. So I think the dis discussion should be about the question how it is going to change and where are the opportunities, where are the new possibilities we do have and how at the end we will achieve new qualities by digitalization uh, related to international mobility. 
Darko. Darko Jansen from the uh, EADTU, the European Association of Distance Teaching Universities. You know about this, no? You can give us a little bit more information about how virtual mobility is already taking place. Um, yes. Um, from EDTU, from the European Association of Distance Teaching Universities, I'm program manager. And indeed, uh, we are experiencing many ways why, how virtual mobility can be done. So that can be done at the course level, so then it's about the exchange of uh, material, uh, students and staff collaborating within one course. And then you can question, is that fit mobility or is that kind of open mobility or is that online education, online education cross-border? So then you can have a discussion, what's fit mobility? And fit mobility can also be on uh, network curricula, uh, joint degrees. And you see that already happening, that not only in a physical component, but also in an online component. So, yes, it's happening, but it has different advantages and different characteristics. So, physical mobility is about the cultural exchange, it's about immersion, the personal uh, development. Well, fit mobility, it's more about the academic experience, about also the cultural, but it has advantage of scalability, the scale. You can reach much more students, but they don't have the experience of going to Rome, the immersion, building up friends and networks in that way, in an online way. Okay, but as a, do you think that distance teaching universities have an advantage when it comes to virtual mobility? Do you think that more and more students will be looking for your kind of offer? Or do we have to turn to the side to my left we have here uh, Professor Dr. Cornelia Freitag, uh, the Vice, Vice Rector for Academic and International Affairs of the Ruhr University in Bochum. And we have Professor Jürgen Handke, Philips University Marburg, representing the physical um, higher education provisions. So do you see your model on the rise? If you see uh, mobility as uh, on a university perspective, where there is an exchange uh, of students on a curriculum level, then both ways work. Both, uh, there's no advantage for open university or distance universities compared to research. They need to change and redesign the curricula. The open universities or the physical ones? Both. Okay, that uh, gives, gives the word to uh, Ms. Professor Freitas. So how do you have to change? How are you changing? Digital change brings a change in teaching, brings a change in what you teach, brings a change to how you do research and thereby bring students into research. And all this also affects how students should encounter um, global questions and should encounter mobility. So this all hangs together and I say I totally agree that it's uh, the distant university, it's the on-site universities um, that face basically the same challenges and, and can use the same opportunities. And what are these challenges, the key challenges? <laughs> Um, I think some of the challenges were just mentioned in the keynote um, and uh, if one well, could sort them probably according to the stakeholders. So one challenge is that most of the teachers at the moment teaching at universities have learned um, to teach without the possibilities um, of digitization. And so one challenge is to bring these professors into contact with the new possibilities. Another challenge is economical. Mm -hmm. um, and another challenge is also to um, teach the digital natives that you can use Google and you can use uh, libraries for other things than just fun. Okay, I saw Professor Handke nodding when you were talking about teaching. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. First of all, I would like to mention that I'm possibly a rare species in this audience. I'm a teacher, and I teach eight hours per week, and I do it in a digital format. And I have the feeling that many in the audience have not a real idea about what digital teaching and learning is. 
So let me show it to you. <clears throat> this is classical teaching. This is my position when I teach in a classical format. Now, some teachers thought, and by the way, I've, uh, I have a small handout where you can see the models on the second page. Um, so this is classical teaching. Now, many teachers think they can enrich classical teaching by using this and PDF documents as a sort of additional tool in their teaching. This augmentation model doesn't achieve anything, let alone virtual mobility or internationalization. What you do have to do as a teacher is this. This is my position in my classes. I'm here asking you, can I help you? Can I help you? Possibly not. So this is my position. It's the inverted classroom. It's not the flipped classroom we heard previously about that empties or gives us a chance to empty lecture halls. No, we fill lecture halls with students and our opposition are in a position to guide them through the content because everything they do in advance is digital. And now we have a digital teaching and learning scenario which I call blended learning on my handout. I have several options. They all have in common, they have a deepening phase. A deepening phase where you train competences, where you train other things. And this deepening phase in online courses, and that's one of the disadvantages of MOOCs, where this phase doesn't exist, it has never existed there. This has to be converted, so everything what I did here has to be turned into digital formats, then you have true digital teaching and learning. And that's the decisive point, and once you have that, you can turn that into new classes and new formats. I gave you the example of an MA degree program on the first page, and then you can have virtual mobility. We had three online courses in a, in a master degree program, and our students could at the same time, while they were doing classes in Marburg, study in Jamaica or in England, our partners. That's what you can do, and that is digital teaching and learning. I hope I gave you a slight idea about it. Thank you very much. Now we have a reaction to that. Yeah, I just wanted to comment, uh, because I'm also a teacher, um, it's very hard to stay seated, but I will. With, with, a, redu <laughs> with a reduction, though, with a reduction uh, yeah, as a great. vice rector. <laughs> um, and, and what you've just, we, you've just uh, participated in, a, in an experiment to realize uh, that also for the students or the ones on the other end of teaching, um, uh, things are not easy because of all the people uh, here, only 59 participated in the questionnaire. Because if you have a teacher like this, as a student, you also need to be more active. And that is what I meant when I said that it's, uh, there are challenges to basically everybody involved. Yes, challenges. Now let's go to the next challenge because I would like to get Oliver Janoszka in the loop. Oliver, what is the challenge on the European level? Well, uh, if you allow me, I also like to comment. I used to be a, a teacher when I was in my lecture well, ship program with the Bosch Foundation on a physical mobility level, let's say. Um, and if if I may comment on the on the yes, slide from the questionnaire, my reading of this result is basically that uh, it has to uh, to do with the transformational aspect that is addressed there. So, what is the potential to challenge and change the current structures? And in this regard, um, I also find it interesting that collaborative learning is put directly next to it, almost as many votes as uh, uh, virtual mobility. And um, I think it uh, demonstrates that there's a lot to do. This is, let's say, also our uh, finding from um, the Hochschul Forum. In many studies, uh, I could elaborate now, but just to uh, address this virtual mobility, I think the question is, what are the structures? What are the platforms? What are the network agreements? So where is really um, the facilitation process that uh, universities can apply, that they can uh, build into their systems, that they can integrate into their strategies? And this is maybe also where the European dimension comes in, um, that this needs to be frameworked, that this uh, has to uh, be negotiated between uh, different stakeholders on, on different levels, but I think the potential is out there that this is not just a claim, that the whole conference uh, title, that um, 
Uh, this can be a reality 20 years after Bologna has been uh, implemented, um, that we now need to look at it how digitally enhanced uh, the transformation process could look like. I think we all agree on that, and I think we have already put our fingers on one of the most important aspects, which is teaching. No? Especially in higher education, where teaching has not been so much at the core of discussions, and research seems to always be more of a concern, uh, we need to refocus on teaching. And I would like to understand a little bit better what we can do on teaching, and I'll tell you why. Because, as Oliver mentioned, on a European level, we are developing frameworks. We have a digital competence framework that was mentioned in the keynote this morning that uh, shaped the new formulation of digital competence and the new um, key competences recommendation. And we also have a framework on, a recent framework on the digital competence of educators, which I have authored. So this reflects exactly your debates. That's why I don't have to replicate what you said. And we also have a framework for organizations, DICOMP org where we uh, try to capture how organizations can build on their digital capacity with a new tool that we're developing, but only for schools for the time being. So having said all that, <laughs> end of my <laughs> dissemination of European models, what is the problem with teaching? So what do we have to change? You said we have to change the format. Not only the format, we have to change the minds, the minds of the teachers. I don't know how many percent, but I have the feeling that 95% of the German teachers at universities are reluctant to change their teaching models of the 20th and centuries before. That's the main problem. They are, they are filled with fears. They don't want to collaborate. They don't want to share information. They talk about the dangers and risks. And if that doesn't help, we have data security in German, Germany. Mm -hmm. So okay. they are reluctant to do anything. I would absolutely defend my colleagues and your <laughs> colleagues because I think one of the biggest problems is time here. And I know that a lot of my colleagues would certainly do more and have started to think more about digitization, about the way that would help and about other ways in which to make teaching more student-centered, more student-activating, more collaborative but they do not have enough time. And even for somebody like me, who would like to give it to them, I cannot change the rules and, and the laws and so on and so forth. So one of the big problems is the balance between research and teaching. But um, even for um, researchers who really want to teach, uh, to just reschedule everything is going to take so much time out of their schedule and so on and so forth. So I, I think uh, it's not just reluctance. I think the, the, the problems are more manifold. I, I saw Oliver reacting, but I know that Dark aspect. Horse has a lot to say to this. No, I, I fully agree with the time aspect. Uh, you know how I, how, how I could digitize my entire subject? I g dropped out of research. I made teaching my new research. And that was it. And I was no longer acknowledged by the linguistic community in the national community as a linguist. I had to suffer from that very much. And only after I was ready, I gradually came back in again, because then obviously my teaching achievements were somehow acknowledged. I fully agree to that. So we have to do something about the relationship between teaching and uh, research. Oliver. I do think uh, passionate uh, teachers like you, Jürgen, are really um, giving a model for, for the direction. However, I, I'm with you in the sense that uh, people are different academic uh, uh, staff, professors are coming from different backgrounds, so I think it is rather a question on how to catch them. Our reading of the situation is that over the last year in the forum, we do see a lot of teachers that are interested, that are actually really discussing issues, that are discussing with the, in their institutions. And this is again a facilitation process and maybe a division of task uh, project as well. So who is really 
in charge of developing online content. Uh, we, no, the MOOCs have been low on the, uh, on the questionnaire. However, as a new format, um, it is uh, quite uh, having a strong potential, but it is not so easy to develop it. If you want to be successful on that side, I do think what we came up with now since last year is the, to have it as a strategic uh, question. How do you actually, with all the different units, with all the different uh, experts in the institution, can find a, a direction based on the profile of the institution and make good use of it to exploit the opportunities? And in that regard, uh, invite many of the professors to, to really apply it. And, yeah, have a different I, situation. I see that. our professors to my left nodding, but I would like to um, go a little bit into this um, aspect of MOOCs before we go into the right strategies. Uh, Darko, somehow we must be able to learn from you and your experiences because that's what you're doing. You're teaching online, so your teachers must have found the solution. Yes, um, before going into MOOCs, I want to elaborate a little bit on, on teaching and your question as well. Um, um, just before the summer holidays, uh, Edith, you did uh, had a study published on uh, changing pedagogical landscape, and we had a uh, qualitative research in different European countries on the most most successful um, factors and enhancers on digital education. And we also looked at an institutional level, so by interviewing a lot of inter uh, in institutions, and what we see that there is a difference between innovating at a course level. So what you were saying, teaching, you can sit, stand over there or be more interactive with your audience. And that's redesigning your course level. And what you see is that uh, in successful institutions, they see that investment in digital and online education is an more becoming a team effort. So it's not only the professor itself, it's becoming a team effort. And it needs more time in designing and development. And the, the, the catch is that it will give uh, more efficiency, cost efficiency, in the exploitation phase, where you have run, the run of the course itself. But the most successful institutions not only foster the bottom-up process, but also have a top-down strategic plan on digitalization and digital transformation. And the most successful one, you know, for example, the Lausanne, Edinburgh, and the big universities, who indeed have a strategic plan, have seed money to develop online courses and redesign the, the curriculum. And therefore, I was stating as well, you don't only redesign your course level and the way you teach, but also redesign the curriculum level to elaborate and to incorporate more online aspects and including physical and virtual mobility schemes within the curricula. So that's also the systematic kind of change. Just a second. I would like to go back to uh, Professor Freitag, because you also have a strategy at the Ruhr uh, University Bochum. Would, would you also, what would you say are the, the key building blocks of that strategy? Would you agree with Darko? I would absolutely agree, uh, agree because um, he also pointed out quite nicely that there are basically two sides. You need uh, the um, professors and you need them to understand what it means to change, to digitize uh, teaching or to using other ways and other frames and in part also what other content there is to teach. So without this understanding, you can't do nothing. On the other hand, if you do not collect this, and if you do not support this, and if you do not bring uh, the proponents of this together, there will be lots and lots of efforts. Like in my university, uh, we have really great teachers who do a lot with digital means, and uh, they have been doing this for 15 years or so. We have a great uh, center for teaching and learning, and I think these, teach, these centers are absolutely important to uh, facilitate uh, the process, but it only depended on the single teacher to decide, I do it, I don't do it, and uh, they would even be looked down upon because they didn't spend so much time on research. So you need this university effort, and you need to bring together everybody with everybody 
um, to understand this. And this is what our digitization strategy, which we have been discussing for the last two and a half years, uh, with workshops, with bringing in a uh, colleague Handke, and uh, with having discussions with the students, with the teachers, with the administrators, um, to come to a point where we now have more of a vision. It's not even a plan uh, like it was just before it uh, demanded, but we, we are trying to come up with an understanding of the chances, the challenges, and an understanding that digitization does not mean to use a computer in your teaching. Yeah, important. Uh, I want to uh, maybe address also a misunderstanding that I feel is still uh, in place in this uh, question, what is the professor actually responsible for? Um, because uh, we think that uh, there is a great synergy potential in the sense that uh, it doesn't need to be each single professor um, uh, providing the provision even. But you can, uh, if you look into uh, the dimension of strategic partnership, if you look at the inter-institutional collaboration, then uh, we do see models out there, piloted, working, where one is recognizing what the other has been doing. And if this sort of uh, process is into place, if there are maybe standards, transparency, what has been recognized from who, how could in a uh, network of trust uh, this be, uh, be um, further developed. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, case that uh, still nowadays I think is, is not very much common in Europe and in Germany. What's, one last example, please. Uh, I think, uh, for instance, the, the micro masters that have been developed now over a short period of time in, in the edX platform uh, is, is an interesting showcase where um, they do have agreements with the uh, campus universities to recognize what someone has uh, been doing online and take this into account. Karen has been doing that as well to find university agreements for the refugees to really uh, say if you have been able to demonstrate your competencies in an online study environment then we are ready to take you on board for the final year of the studies or let's say a longer period but you know this this sort of um, translation this uh, this agreement on these uh, processes that needs to be much further exploited wouldn't that be a role for the DEAD yeah I think we we should try to to balance our discussion between the two main themes, which is on one hand digitization, on the other hand international cooperation, mobility and so on. So we were now discussing more or less the question of how well how teaching is needed to be changed if we introduce technical resources, digitization and so on. Now if we revert that on the international level on the question of what does this mean for international cooperation and, and relations. I would be interested to know more from, from you, from the universities, and I know that Mrs. Freitag is also Vice, Re Vice President for International Relations. Um, so how does this build in into your strategy of international relations with other universities into maybe joint programs, joint degrees, uh, into mobility of teachers and researchers? All this is going to change, and we, would, we as DID, we need to know in which direction and at what exact point Universities w would say, here we do need some help, which is money. So where, where do you need an assistance? Where do you need something which brings us forward on our way? Thanks. Yeah, can I say something? Because I was uh, thinking when we were talking that, of course, one of the most important things to convince somebody to change his or her teaching is to explain why. I mean, if I'm a successful teacher, why should I change a winning horse? Internationalization and growing internationalization might be one of the reasons why you would want to include more digital means. One would be to create classes that are taught on both sides of the Atlantic or wherever and bring together students via um, Skype or whatever um, 
although it is also important, and I want to say this, it is still very important that these classes who might have seen each other only via the screen will have the chance to meet. So combined uh, programs or, or funding of, of programs that involve blended learning, that involve COIL, that is Cooperative International Learning, um, so distant learning kind of, plus the possibility to do summer schools or whatever and bring and, and move the, the students. That would be a very, very good program, I think. Um, so because that was, the question, yeah, but, but I think that internationalization is, is one of the things that are enabled in a more profitable way by using digitalization. And so it's one we have, internationalization is one of the fields in our strategy. Inclusion is another one, right? Now you, now you just said that international internationalization could be an argument that could convince lecturers to change their teaching methods. Isn't it also the other way around that the fact that there are new formats of teaching and learning such as MOOCs and OER are giving rise to new international, international learning and opportunities for integrating that into local learning? Absolutely. Yes, uh, perhaps address the topic on OER because it was very high in the, it in the survey. It was second highest. Second highest. Mm -hmm. And it was MOOCs a little bit wasn't. surprised for me because uh, you mentioned also MOOCs, MOOCs as an enabler, as an innovator of in education. Uh, OERs are already there since Open Courseware in 2002, so it's already 16 years. What's the impact of 16 years on OER? Hardly. So I was surprised by the high ranking of OER. But I know of initiatives in North Rhine-Westfalen where you change uh, and exchange and collaborate on, uh, on educational content and with an open licensing. Um, can I have for two minutes on MOOCs and how it changes mobility and digitalization? Okay. I think so. Okay. Remember in 2011 12, the year of the MOOCs, uh, MOOCs were transforming the higher education market uh, mainly by having MOOCs positioned as part of open education, like OER. For free, but not like OER, only educational content, a complete course for free. And it will open up education for many, for all, uh, the, the sustainable development goals of UNESCO, getting uh, quality education to as many people as possible. That changes because of the business models. The big platform providers like Coursera, edX, mainly American, were struggling by private invest, uh, investigators as with their business model. And they changed the open for free. Well, OER is open for free plus educational licensing, open licensing as well. They changed their model to more, uh, the content might be for free, but you need to pay for certificates or you need to pay for moderation uh, and assessment, etc. But that model this did not work for their business model. They didn't get enough money for that. So they did another trick, and uh, Oliver was already uh, mentioning this, is micro masters, nano degrees, professional degrees, short degrees, etc. And that's a big market. So they changed the market for MOOCs, not for free anymore, so perhaps we call them online courses, you have to pay for, and they packed it in a number of courses together with an, an assignment or a project to get a short degree, micro masters. And they get a lot of money of that, both at the platform and both from the universities. And then last couple of years, uh, universities are also recognizing the completion of a micromaster into a degree. So we have to imagine when MOOC started, professors start, oh, I have a lecture, I will record, and then the pedagogical <laughs> was a disaster, but they changed it to a, a degree course into a MOOC open for free, then it changed to continuous education, continuous professional development, who is now recognized as part of degree education, mostly postgraduate, but there are experiments in Europe where they try to um, split a bachelor degree in six or seven different micro-masters, so also the redesign of the, core, uh, the curriculum at the bachelor level 
is becoming more modular, more flexible, more market-driven by number of um, uh, short decrees. And that enhances internationalization, not in, in the traditional way, but in, traditional in that there are a number of international students following those short decrees. It's becoming more online education, international education, and some of those students will be involved and enrolled at traditional universities in the degree education. So because they completed the MicroMaster, they are now interested in to follow a degree education uh, at the university. Um, so when we talk about Bologna Coast Digital, are we only talking about degree education and changes of how we teach a course level? No. We are talking about redesigning the curricula, like the example with micro, micro masters, etc. The curricula will be more building of short degrees, etc., including online students. Moreover, Bologna Coast Digital needs to include open education and continuous professional development, continuous education. We already know the lifelong learning needs are very high. It's not the bachelor or the master completion when it finishes. You need to have the continuous education. And then you see that the mobility schemes, international, are focusing not only on the degree education, but increasingly on continuous professional development. The micro masters, it's degree education, but it's mainly continuous professional development. And there, there's a huge opportunity for Europe to collaborate on this field. Bologna Coast Digital, not only degree, but also in open education and continuous professional development. So that's mine. So what you're saying is that traditional universities have not really embraced these new, so new opportunities for uh, professional development? Yes, of course. You see uh, Edinburgh or, or other big universities in Europe, they do that. They have a distinct strategic plan to transform the degree education, but also to increase the offering and continuous education for international students and open education. The uh, University of Edinburgh is even estimating that in 2022, if I'm correct, the number of students in continuous professional development open education will be more than in the career education. So it's an increasing field for them. I talked to, uh, to you yesterday evening where you say, yeah, for, for, for me as a traditional university within the U, uh, German law and within the context of academic careers, it's not a possibility to do that. But in the Netherlands, you see that Delft and Wageningen are investing in this. So it depends on the university. And it depends on the system the university is in. And the governmental rules and the funding, the, exactly, etc. Yeah. Exactly. And I think uh, the government in Germany really has to think twice about keeping rules about how much it, mm, uh, the capacity of somebody to teach is and stuff like this. Uh, whether it wants us to get ahead and not fall back. But what would be getting ahead? Would that be addressing new cohorts of potential students or would it be uh, having more strategies for how to include digitalization? Would it be, because I see a much more innovative approach here from the, our European representative, <laughs> where we see something on the horizon that is not manifest reality in most countries or for most traditional universities. So what would be the direction that you would want policy to, to go to? Uh, the organization of the teaching load mm -hmm. is totally out of the hands of the universities. You just, everybody has to teach a certain amount of hours and it's already hard sometimes to fit in digitization because you're not in the classroom. But it's all basically based on face-to-face -face contacts. It's nine hours for full professors, it's 16 or whatever, and then it's different in federal states. Yeah, so, so, so this doesn't make it easy to implement distant learning. <laughs> so that, that would be one of the things. Can I be bold? Um, um, if you look at um, um, uh, digital education and internationalization, then I can say, why don't we have a MOOC platform in Europe? There's an American domination. And perhaps it's diversity, language diversity, what's hindering Europe to get a platform only in France. We have a platform, and now there's an Israel, a Portugal thinking, and perhaps in Germany there will be. There was a feasibility study for that. Um, moreover, 
who can be partner of those MOOC platforms? Only the best ranked universities with money to buy in for Coursera, Etix, etc. Now we have the European University Network Initiative that will Thanks be launched in that. November, October, etc. Who are involved? The best universities. And now we, I talked about continuous education, micromasters. Who are involved? The best universities. So, if I'm a bold statement, if you don't change, you will be a smaller, smaller, smaller university in the region only for degree education. I totally agree. So, so that's not bold. I except, I would disagree. <laughs> except that there are also ways to counter this process, even in the existing system, which, which we do. I have a lot to say, but it's not my role, so therefore <laughs> Oliver will have to, have to take And over. I ask you if you may put in your parts as well. Now, I wanted to disagree in the sense that I feel it's not such a, a holy miracle to, to get going. So, if I look at the small university in Lübeck uh, of applied sciences, many in Germany know about. Um, I mean, they could have been what everybody would expect in the logic of Darko's argument. They would have been very regional, very uh, focused only on, on their local population. However, they managed with some strategic planning to get a real interesting spin-off that is driving uh, many institutions now to, to de develop new uh, uh, study programs, to go international, to have an online platform for MOOCs, and so on. And this is all um, a result of, let's say, a, a, a directed um, a concert of uh, uh, stakeholders that really want to go in that direction. And so, the, if you uh, mention the European MOOC Consortium, I think the, the question in terms of infrastructure is what is needed next. The feasibility study that we have uh, published uh, this year in spring is covering, let's say, scenarios that are needed to be discussed. And I do think the German higher education has a very good brand in general. So maybe in terms of visibility, in terms of internationalization, um, this uh, is an interesting question. How much is this a European project. Uh, where is, um, in this regard, uh, the, the next uh, step? And I know that there are some projects uh, in the development that may cover that, that there are maybe some objectives that are inviting um, other institutions to take part. Um, I feel we need to not forget that uh, once you are moving, things are changing. I, I totally agree. And of course, I was, com I was concentrating on some of the hindrances, some of the challenges, but of course there are other ways in which uh, universities try to, to overcome these or work around them. And of course there are great opportunities. You already mentioned that in North Rhine-Westphalia we are just uh, starting on a big program that needs to be connected to the national program on building an open source platform for blended learning, for uh, digital teaching, cooperative teaching, which is developed together with the ministry, which gives us a lot of money to do this. And um, so I'm sure that internationalization, again, will be a field in which this will be spent and which will be advanced. I've been pretty example. silent during the past uh, 10 minutes uh, because this is the typical debate. It's a top-down debate. It's a strategic debate. What can we do? But what do we forget? The teachers at the low end. And I'm a teacher. I'm, so I'm, I'm here really to, to tell you from my point of view, what do we have to do in order to um, convince teachers that digitization of their teaching and learning is not only the future, it's, it has to be done these days in the 21st century. Uh, the term open educational resources, wonderful. But would any German teacher take a video that is in the Creative Commons license on YouTube created by a colleague and take that into his own teaching? I tell you, 99% of the German teachers would say no. So we can talk about OER as long as we want. We have to change the minds. We have to change the whole thing from bottom up and not only strategically from top yeah, but down, I think otherwise it wouldn't all, work. We are all in agreement with that. We're just uh, trying to identify the different elements that can help. And I yeah, agree with you that we have... We're talking about OER as if uh, it worked. It doesn't. OER does not work at all. And it was one of the, the key 
uh, uh, I know. things in the, in the vote. I know, but I would like uh, you to tell me more, like we are all trying to find measures. The Ruhr Universität uh, is developing a huge paper with strategies and elements and measures. And we given, the we're given a million for this, so the teachers have gotten money to now the work The DAAD on is spending money. The European Commission is putting money on the new European University networks. So we're, we have, I think, investment at different levels. And now you're saying that what we need is we need to get the teachers on board. Now, the European Commission, in my person, is developing frameworks and tools for the teachers themselves to get hooked on the topic and understand what they can do. You don't need what a else? tool in order to use a video created by a colleague. So what you do you need? You don't need a tool for that. So what do you need? Well, you need to change their minds. That's it. And how? Well, in order to, I, I show them how they can use, in my workshops, how they can use uh, OER. I create content from astronomy to zoology via theology for them. And then they see how easy it is. And then they start, you have to show it to them in workshops, not only giving the keynotes about it, but you have to show them what to do. Which is why the Centers for Learning and Teaching I are think so everybody, important. <laughs> everybody wants so, to say something about no, but I know, changing I minds. I think we now uh, have uh, yeah. this, uh, this topic uh, consolidated. We need yeah. these centers and uh, more information that gets to the teachers themselves. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Müller. Yeah, changing minds. I think, will will uh, a center we help? Will a center help? We have been yes. touching on some, some hurdles, some difficulties, and, and you use terms like business model. I don't know if German universities have a business model. I'm not sure. Anyway, I mean, you have structures, you have legal boundaries, and so on. Is it needed to change this? Maybe. You touched upon the, the issue of lo lifelong learning and, and continuous education. We talked yesterday about this and you told us that more or less German universities are not asked to do this or are even not allowed to do it. So there are things which need to be changed. Now, how to change this? We, I mean, our experience is that sometimes if you take, take a detour by international projects, you achieve a certain change. This is very interesting if I take transnational education, which is growing worldwide. And in a sense, what we are now talking about in the digital, uh, uh, in digital terms is transnational education, the sense of international mobility of programs and providers. And this kind of mobility, the mobility of our universities, the institutions, their programs, this is some, something which, which triggers change and may trigger even uh, um, the, the, well, the mind of teachers, the mind of professors. If you take professors who went for three, four, five, six times to Almaty or to Istanbul or to Buenos Aires to teach there, that changes their minds. And so in this sense, I think there's maybe a detour, but it may work. But my question is more with this self-critically now, with this detour, are we taking the correct detour? Because another aspect that Darko mentioned was inclusion and diversity. If with more private initiatives and universities uh, flooding the market and with new business models, we obviously have a, a problem with uh, equity. And so I'm thinking, with the new European university networks, are we betting on the right horse? Are we funding the right kind of networks of university if we're settling on excellence? Or do you think that is the right first step? Well, the, the, the broad discussion about that idea is exact, exactly about the question ex excellency versus large access and, and equity. Um, I don't know if we already, I'm looking to Dorothea Ruhland and Mr. Hasenbach, who is around here, uh, who would have a, an opinion on that. I think this is not sorted out yet. And we have to see how the first phase, which is financed by the Erasmus program, how it will come out. But as far as we can see, the first projects, the first groups of universities who are running for it, those are outstanding, well-established, big, good universities. This exactly. is true. One thing that we kind of uh, discovered when we had uh, one of our groups on change uh, management in the first phase of the forum was to distinguish uh, modernization and uh, how to call it, like profile Excellent. development. Huh? Um, and in this regard, I do think you can have both. 
Yes, it's, it's a good idea that there is, uh, by tomorrow afternoon, the results of excellency in Germany, you know, the, the initiative. So, um, we can see that institutions have really, really developed heavily into uh, being part of that. What, you know, this kind of competition is, is uh, fruitful, is, is useful. Um, however, um, we do think that the German higher ed institution system is uh, really doing well also in its, uh, in a, in its broader uh, sense, so you need other measures for that. And modernization, in fact, has many elements that are not um, really uh, needing this sort of investment. So, um, if we look at that from a policy perspective, I, I do think um, the instruments are out there. What I really feel uh, is needed is this what I described and maybe this is close to what we have been saying before is this this push in the sense of it is a priority. We are concerned about that. We are um, aware of this and we are ready to tackle it and one element um, that I found uh, quite important in this regard is the uh, the side from the industry. So we um, see that there are new demands. We see that uh, there is a gap of competencies in certain uh, fields. So how are these addressed? Uh, we have started in the Stifterverband a future skill initiative that is covering uh, uh, key questions on that. And um, on that side, I think universities are um, also invited to uh, develop new curricula, to collaborate more intensively, and uh, in that sense, not even to have this division, lifelong learning on that side and higher ed institution provision on the other one, but it, it's merging. And this is going to be an interesting development that uh, needs the political framework, but I think there are many instruments in place. You see in the, in the questionnaire that collaboration was only given two votes. So collaborative learning, it was 21 or 22, so that's more the didactics within a course in collaborative learning, but collaboration only two. But I'm curious about the workshop this afternoon on collaboration organized by Potsdam, I suppose. But you mentioned uh, Lubeck, and I'm, um, if you look at the university networks, it's the outstanding universities. If you look at the big MOOC platforms, it's MicroMasters, are the outstanding universities. But the most un MOOCs are developed not within those platforms in Europe. They are with their own platform, like Lubeck, and collaborating with others. So the collaboration, both in continuous education and in degree education, is increasingly happening, not by the outstanding one. And your question about detour, I think that the European Commission should only also foster that kind of collaboration and foster diversity in this aspect, and not only for e-excellence of excellence and outstanding universities networks. Okay, we have to close the debate, slowly but surely, but I want to close with one last question. So we're 20 years after the Bologna process. What will happen in the next 10 years? So if we meet again 30 years after Bologna, in 10 years' time, what do you think will have changed by them? And what would you have liked, liked to change, but will probably remain a utopia back then? And I'm going to start this way round to stop again how we started with Herrn Müller. I believe that this, uh, what we called in this whole week, shaping the digital turn, that this turn is actually already taking place. It needs to be shaped. It will get stronger in that regard. I do think that with our whole society development, that uh, we will see far more integrated uh, tools, provisions, uh, that this, uh, this whole development will look 10 years from now like we have you know, just started it and then it became more uh, integrated, more normal, more common ground. That of course you, you collaborate within the uh, European higher education area in uh, the virtual sense. You will have the uh, physical mobility, but this, this uh, trend will get much stronger. It will be more fluid, what I said, between the different segments of education. Lifelong learning uh, will be more closely connected with Oliver, higher one education, sentence. one sentence. And what I last, not least, like to mention is I think the force of the student is going to be far more productive. We had students here at Tech Hackathon, good ideas, good driving force. Chiron was implemented through students. So this sort of creative, productive uh, force will, um, you know, change the university structures as well, from inside and outside. 
we have students here too from all our degree programs and uh, they have been hopefully enjoying the type of uh, um, integrated, digitally integrated teaching and learning. Well, my um, hope is that uh, more will happen in the next 10 years than happened uh, previously. In 2007, I wrote an article called The Virtual Linguistics Campus e Bologna. It's on your list. I was surprised that it's so, such a long time ago because everything that is said there, is, the situation is still the same. Okay. I would have a couple of statements, but I, to be brief, um, I, I think that research becomes more and more internationalized. And uh, I would think that by not continuing to really cut off research and teaching, but by bringing them more together, we will also bring more internationalization into the classroom because research is project driven and you can do projects with international partners and you can bring this into the classroom. And so that would be one thing we haven't mentioned, and I wanted to mention, which I think is going to be strengthened over the last next 10 years. Thank you for that. You're right. I'm a little bit pessimistic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like you say, what, what, what changed in 2007 to your article now? So if you look at the Bologna process, it is a poli poli politics process. So that's uh, little change. Uh, I hope that in 10 years we have a European student pass uh, where we can have transparency and recognition uh, of not only degree education but also on uh, achievements in continuous education, continuous professional development. So that's my dream. I need, need to work on that, that in 10 years we will have a European system not only for degree but also on continuous education with recognition and transparency of achievements of each students. Yeah, my vision would be that from now on in 10 years, my two grandsons will be at university and that university will be different and will have some of those features you, you, who you mentioned, which you mentioned uh, now, like the European student pass, they will easily move from one university to another university in Europe or outside, outside Europe. You, you, they will use digital platforms for teaching, for learning and for administrative issues. Okay, thank you very much for this exciting debate. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I think you have deserved your lunch now. <laughs> <laughs>